Welcome. My name is Jill Tejan. I'm Vice President of the Board of Directors of the National Women's Hall of Fame. And induction every time it's held is such a wonderful and inspiring and motivational event. So I'm delighted to be here in Seneca Falls, New York, the birthplace of women's rights and the home of the National Women's Hall of Fame. Hi, I'm Carol Scott, a member of the Board of Directors. I am a fairly new board member and this is my first induction and I'm very excited uh, to witness uh, the excitement that goes on with induction. And we wish the Maryland Women's Heritage Center and Jill Moss Greenberg and Linda Shevitz, lots of luck and we hope you will join us in our efforts to recognize great women. I, um, I am Judy Pfeiffer and I am a member of the Board of Directors and a 2007 inductee into the Hall and in addition this year I'm one of the co-chair chairs of induction and uh, the local organizing committee has been very very busy getting ready for this event um, as, as, uh, as my colleague said we have nine wonderful women who are being inducted into the hall. The National Women's Hall of Fame is a national museum and we incorporate board members from around the country. Uh, we are inducting women from around the country. We have nominators from around the country. We have uh, excellent people who are asked to evaluate the applications from around the country and the system we have set up to evaluate the, the inductees that are chosen from the roughly 200 or so applications that we receive every two years uh, um, is uh, totally outside the board of directors and the staff. It is driven by the colleagues and people within the country. And uh, we hope that the people of Maryland will, first of all, nominate future inductees into the hall and will second of all come and honor them at the next induction in 2015. We're excited to be here yes. at this event, the Women's Hall of Fame, and I want to thank you so much for coordinating all of this, uh, having all these wonderful women leaders here. Uh, what are some of the criteria that you use to select? Well, I think one of the things that everyone really needs to understand is that we do not select. It's an independent panel of judges who are expertise in their, have expertise in their own fields. And it's national, you know, nominations, grassroots, the American people. So we don't even know who's in the pool. And board members are allowed to nominate, but we have no, they go through the same process as anyone else. And we've kept it that way specifically so that there's no conflict of interest. Um, and we've been very happy over the years that you know, it all works out in the end. And it's a selection. And I think it's an important distinction. It's a selection, not an election. Um, so. These women are from all walks of life yes. and professions. Yes. It's so exciting to have these role models. Yes. It, oh, we love it. Yeah. We love it. I mean, it's always oh, Beverly. Yes. 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 It's so great to meet you it's and nice to, meet you too. Uh, to be a part of this whole celebration. Now, what brought you to the organization? Well, I was a volunteer in Los Angeles. And actually, my good friend and also uh, colleague in a lot of nonprofit organizations, Beth Bullitt Thomas, told me about this wonderful organization and induction uh, many years ago and encouraged me to join the board. So that's how I got uh, really involved. And it is infectious. You come here, you learn about the history of Seneca Falls. And uh, and you're a convert no matter what. I mean, you really, really understand the significance of the history of this part of the country and also the, the role models that they give us, that they provide, and, and how we learn to to break through barriers. How Absolutely. have they broke through their barriers? Yes. yes. Right. Well, and I, one of the one I will say that one of the ones for me this year in particular, just as a personal, is Bernice, Dr. Bernice Rustin Sadler, a Maryland woman. Well, yes, and I have two daughters, and I remember very clearly when. Title IX passed because we and I know Beverly can say the same thing. I mean, we didn't we didn't have the opportunity to play sports, and even though we know Title IX is broader than that, so 
sort of to be able to say thank you to someone like Dr. Sandler because my daughters are able to play sports is always a wonderful opportunity. Um, to your point about legacy and then and what I they bring. Also say too, yeah. um, we always use these stories because we're sort of generational. And when I was applying to college, I can name all the colleges that women could not apply to in the late 60s. And so Bernice Sandler, uh, her leg that legislation changed, it, and you can it see the change. Did. It certainly did. Um, Hi, Jill and Linda. We're sorry you couldn't be here. We're thinking of you. Who looks like we're talking? Yes, I know. <laughs> On behalf of the Maryland Women's oh. Heritage Center, Linda Shevitz, Jill Moss Greenberg, and all the women from Maryland, we are so proud of you. Oh, I am proud of them because I know what they have done, and they do a lot of tremendously good work and hard work. But you have been our leader through the, all of the wonderful um, Title IX programs that you have uh, really pushed forward in the laws and so on. Yeah, it takes a lot of people to do it, and you pass a law and it's great, but there have got to be people who then push to get that law enforced, and mm -hmm. that's what those women are doing and have been doing for years. And without that, Title IX is not as good as it, as it would be, as it could be. Yeah. How do you feel looking back on the oh. struggle? Um, when Title IX was passed, we did not know how important it was. We knew about discrimination in admissions, in graduate schools. Uh, we really didn't know much about it. something about, about vocational guidance in high schools, but we really had no idea of the extent of discrimination. In 1970, when the hearings are held, and in 1972, Title IX is passed, there's not even the word sexism. There's no word for sexual harassment. There's no word for acquaintance rape, all of which are covered in, in educational institutions. And so we saw the scope of Title IX as somewhat smaller than it ended up being. Uh, athletics was not an oversight. We knew it was going to cover athletics. And my idea of how it would cover athletics was, uh, uh, many people know what play day is or field day. They mm -hmm. cancel classes and have relay races and activities. And my idea, I remember saying to someone, so on play day, you know what this means? There's going to be more activities for girls. We had no idea of the impact because no one had ever done a study on what the data was, what it would look like. And when my, where I used to work at the Association of American Colleges and Universities, we did the first report on sex discrimination in collegiate athletics in 1973. This is right after Title IX has passed. We could find no data at all. All we had was a huge list of horrible anecdotes. <laughs> From Jill and Linda Shevitz and the w women at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center, we thank you so much and please, Keep up the great work. Oh, well, that's what I would say to them, <laughs> because they're doing the hard work, which is in the field. They'll, they need to do continue, and I know that they will. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. We're thank grateful. You. Thank you. So, first of all, congratulations. It's a huge honor. Thank you very much. What we would like to hear from you is, how is this going to, and has already impacted future generations, why is this important for daughters and granddaughters and the legacy. Can you talk about yeah. the legacy of it? Yeah, Title IX is going to keep working for us, and we hope, for a very long time, because it takes a long time for certain kinds of changes. Uh, Title IX has gotten rid of a lot, not all, but a lot of the official policies and practices that were all over higher education and K through 12. Uh, I think what um, the big impact of that, for me, this was totally unanticipated, is that um, I have three grandchildren, and a reporter recently asked me how Title IX affected my grandchildren. And I wanted to say that my granddaughter was a wonderful athlete and had an athletic scholarship, and of course I couldn't say that because Jessica was the kind of child who, when she played on a soccer team for three games, asked if she could quit because she said, I don't care what happens to a ball. <laughs> so she does other things, but I think what <laughs> all three grandchildren, two grandsons and one granddaughter have, is friends of the other gender with whom they are not romantically engaged. And I think that is a legacy that reads well because it says that men and women and boys and girls are going to have better relationships, not based on sex, not based on power, but on equality. And we see this even in kindergarten sometimes and all the way through. When I was a child, this would have been virtually impossible. Um, and in fact, I can remember having discussions with friends. Is, Do you think a man and woman could ever be friends without sex getting in the way? 
and that's not a question anymore that people ask us. We know that men and women can be friends, and I think that's the the unanticipated and true legacy of Title IX is change the relationships between boys and girls and men and women. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Me. Yeah, you'll also be in my acceptance speech. <laughs> 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 you wrote it in advance. We got a little pretend it's the first time you've read it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Subsequently, Dr. Sandler was instrumental in the development and passage of Title IX, a law that was passed in 1972 requiring gender equity for boys and girls in every educational program that receives federal funding. making her the first woman ever appointed to a congressional committee staff to work specifically on women's issues. She wrote the education section for the first federal report on sex discrimination in education. And she was appointed by President Ford and Carter as the first chair of the National Advisory Council on Women's Educational Programs. For your more than four decades of pioneering leadership in the struggle to ensure educational equality for women and girls, Bernice Resnick Sandler, you are now inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Because there was no recourse. You could just say, I don't want this and 
that's not very effective. Title IX gave women and girls and boys and men, it covers sex, not just girls and women, but everybody. Um, Title IX um, gave people a weapon to use when things like excluding girls from a class because they were girls when that occurs. Uh, it can be used as a threat, which is really nice. This is Title IX, you can be sued for this. Wonderful thing to say when people are really big head. Uh, <laughs> It can be used as a way to figure out what kinds of new policies need to be developed, or how to fix old policies and practices. Uh, it's an organizing tool to get people to think about gender, uh, and it helps students, faculty, employees, and everybody in school and outside of schools begin, begin to understand some of the differences in ways in which men and women are treated, and boys and girls, and to understand their rights. I want to give you some examples of what was quite common before Title IX was passed. During one period in the 1960s, and I know most of you may not have been around that, but it was not that long ago in my life, there were 21,000 women in the state of Virginia who were rejected from admissions to state colleges and universities in Virginia. Now, during that same time, when the 21,000 women are rejected, how many men do you think were rejected? Zero. Not one man was rejected, and I have often wondered what happened to those 21,000. I know that most of them never got to college because of that. And what Title IX did was get rid of those quotas. Uh, here's an example of you know, sports for the University of Michigan. Like most institutions, the budget for men's varsity sports is over a million dollars, which would be nothing today, but in those days it was a big budget for sports. And what do you think the budget was for women's varsity sports? Zero. <laughs> yes. Um, and what the women athletes had to do, and they did this at many institutions, which is they would sell apples, in some institutions they sell like Christmas trees, but the Michigan was apples, uh, and they would use that money not to pay for all of their expenses, because they couldn't raise that much money. They used that money to pay for their, part of their uniforms, part of their travel costs, part of their equipment, because their budget was zero. Can you know, kind of imagine a football team having a big sale to pay for their shoulders? <laughs> The few women faculty that were hired in those days will often pay less, sometimes even worked for nothing. I knew a one woman scientist and assistant professor at one of the most prestigious schools in the West, where her husband also taught. He was a full professor. She was an assistant professor <laughs> with a very small stipend and no office. But she finally was promoted and given an office and given a raise when she was awarded the Nobel Prize for her. <laughs> I was extraordinarily naive as to how social change occurred. I really thought it would take one year to get rid of sex discrimination. <laughs> we would simply tell someone that they were discriminating and they would be very polite and say, I'm so sorry, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> At the end of the year, I realized it was going to take a little longer. And over the years, I kept extending my estimate of how long this was going to take us. It's clearly going to take longer than my foolish estimate. Getting Title IX passed was really the easy part compared to the work that was needed to make Title IX actually uh, to be a law with power in it. Um, change did not, does not occur spontaneously simply because there's a new law in place. It took hard work, mostly by women, but also by some very good men to, to press for the changes in policies, to press for the changes in practices and in behaviors. Someone had to be the person to start a group to say that a particular discriminatory practice or rule was not fair and the violation of Title IX. Someone had to gather data, sometimes secretly and at great risk, and analyze that data to show that the rule or practice was discriminatory and to develop new policies and practices. Change is slow and an awful, a painful process. You don't make friends when you point out that something is very wrong, that it's illegal, and that people might sue you, and all of those things. You don't do that except at your own peril. There are some women, uh, many women were not promoted, many women were fired, many women did not get tenure, many women did not get uh, raises, many lost their jobs. These are, the, there were even some who had to go on welfare. These are the true unsung heroes of Title IX because they did the hard work of raising unpleasant facts, pushing for change. Simply having a law in place is not enough. It's only the first step. 
Much has been accomplished with Title IX, although there is still much to do. Uh, we like to think that there's been a lot of progress in athletics, and indeed there has, but we have really only gone from absolutely horrid to very bad. And there are still a long way to go. Okay, let me just give you one figure. The number of high school women athletes that are participating in high school athletics today is less than the number of male high school athletes who are participating in sports when Title IX was first passed back in 1972. So we haven't even caught up to the level of male high school participation in sports that was there 40 years ago. So you can see we have a long way to go. Most high schools, most college, college athletic programs are not in compliance with Title IX. None. Another area of concern is that of sexual assault. Um, here's a dreadful figure. About 20 to 25 percent of college women students, and you know women students in college, uh, or we'll have some coming up, you should think about this, about 20 to 25 percent of them will experience either attempted or actual sexual assault from someone they knew while they are in college. That rate is uh, about the rate that it is for women in the military, and it is lower than the rate for sexual assault for women who are not in college. That is a stunning figure, and we have a very long way to go. Now, people are always asking me questions about Title IX, and I love to talk about it. And recently, a reporter asked me if I had any grandchildren, all three of them are here today, and I said, yes, I have two grandsons and one granddaughter, and they're all in college. And then he asked me how Title IX affected them. And I have to say there was a little piece of me that wanted to say that my granddaughter was a terrific athlete and had an athletic scholarship and all of that. And my granddaughter, at the age of eight or nine, was in a soccer team and she played about three games and then she asked her mother if she could quit. And my daughter said, why do you want to quit? And Jessica said, I just don't care about what happens to a ball. <laughs> But in any event, uh, no, that's <laughs> uh, then I thought again, what, what, really, what has the real effect been on, of Title IX on my grandchildren? And I really thought for about almost maybe 20 or 30 seconds, which is a long time, uh, when someone is interviewing you, all three of my grandchildren in the world Cup, all three of them throughout their young lives have had friends, genuine friendships with people of the other gender where there was no sexual or romantic issues involved. They are just genuine friends, regardless of the gender. Uh, that kind of relationship was almost impossible when I was growing up. I can remember having discussions with other girlfriends in terms of what we called platonic relationships. I, mean, I know that term, but it meant non-sexual. And we would say, can a man and woman really be friends without being sexually involved? We now know that that's quite easy to do when there is equality between men and women. Um, and the succession to be changed. In the long run, this is what Title IX is ultimately all about. Respect, respectful relationships between boys and girls and men and women. This is not just a women's movement. It is not just a feminist movement. It is a worldwide revolution which will take generations to fulfill and will have as much impact on the world as the Industrial Revolution has had. It is a revolution that is changing the relationships between men and women in a way that has never before happened in human history. We have only just begun. We have taken the very first faltering steps of a very long journey, and our schools, our colleges, the United States, our country, and the world will never again be the same. Thank you very much.
Gutenberg and all of the people from the Mary Women's Heritage Center. This is this is all great appreciation for all your tremendous work. They did. Well, no, I know that. I mean, they're just so thrilled. They're so sorry they can't be here today. I will look at this later. Oh yeah, of course, of course. And I will. That's for you too. From all of us. <laughs> oh, but oh, all of us. Oh, you put the thank you for it. You're from the Maryland and, boy. And uh, Becky Schultz. <laughs> oh. When she, 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 she. Emily, we're here at Seneca Falls in the uh, Women's Hall of Fame induction and your mother, Bernie Sandler, is being inducted. How proud of you? Are you? you know, we are so proud of her. We've always been proud of her, and we really watched her career grow from the beginning. And all we saw was this woman that worked hard and never gave up. And she went through so much to get to where she is today. So we're proud of her today, but we've been proud of her for many years. And she's just always been a woman that just just wanted to do more and do better. And I love how she wanted to do something to help you know the, the community, the country at large. And we're proud of her for that, too. I loved how she kept saying her mother and father to ask questions. Yes. And I'm sure she's passed that on to you. Yes, she, that's true. She did. I'm a teacher and my sister's an attorney and we both believe in helping other people and raising the quality of life for others. And um, one of the things that's interesting I think about my mother is that when she got into the women's movement, it wasn't him. It wasn't accepted. People were very, some people were pretty mean to her, in fact. So she didn't have the support that women today have who are working on women's issues. She was doing it way before it was really accepted. And so she had a very hard, hard time and she never made her. You know, it's interesting, I say to my students all the time, we don't say we can't do something, we say it's challenging. And that's her, that was her attitude from the beginning. She never gave up. And uh, how she, she broke so through the barriers and never Dina, she said Jasmine, that no. Yeah, she would not have yeah. no. And I think she's always had a really positive attitude. She always has had a lot of energy. Look at her, right? Amazing. Amazing. A lot of energy. And she takes great care of herself. And she's just an incredible woman. And I think even if I wasn't her daughter, I'd be an admirer of her. And I think my mother's made some great change in the world and left a beautiful legacy. And we are so proud of her. We're dancing up and down, <laughs> jumping up and down and dancing. Well, as you really should. Good. And thank you so much for sharing the time with us today. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I hope you enjoyed the show. The next induction ceremony will be in 2015. But in the meantime, there are ways for you to become involved. You can become a member of the National Women's Hall of Fame. And you can support the fundraising campaign for the Mill Rehabilitation Project. See you in 2015. It's the Hall, Hall of Fame. It's the Hall, Hall of Fame. It's the Hall, Hall of Fame.